Hello, Chess.com listeners. Welcome to my series on judgment and planning. This is International Master Mark Ginsberg, and I'm going to be talking today about a couple of games I've played in the past, which illustrate uh, the themes of judgment and planning pretty well. In American Swisses, it's often the case that you're going to be playing a player who is in a very aggressive frame of mind. The best way to deal with an aggressive player is to uh, formulate a plan that's sound and uh, meets the opponent head-on. Let's see what happened in a game I played against Slava Mihaljuk in the World Open 2002. Uh, Slava Mihaljuk is a senior master who is active on the Seattle team in the U.S. Chess League. Let's see the first couple of moves. I was white and I played c4, c5, knight f3, g6. This usually results in some kind of King's Indian or Benoni structure, this game being no exception d4, bishop g7. At this point, white could consider taking on c5, leading to a Maroxi bind formation, but I opted to, just to bypass him with d5, resulting in a Benoni. Knight f6, knight c3, he castles. I play e4. Now, if he were to play the main line with d6, it's considered most accurate for white to play h3, to prevent the bishop g4 pin, and then follow up with bishop to d3, which has been played in countless games. Instead, he lashed out with b5. He had a very concrete idea in mind. The first idea, of course, is if I take with the knight, he can then take my e-pawn. I don't want to trade a wing pawn for a center pawn. Black would just be better in that position. So I'm going to be taking with the pawn, and he's going to offer a Benko Gambit style move with a6. And of course, black has signaled he's uh, very aggressive here. It's time for white already to formulate a plan, because the plan will dictate the rest of the game. If white crawls into some kind of shell, trying to hang on to the extra pawn, for example, after b takes a, d6, it's going to become a Benko Gambit, and white might not feel like defending that position because black has permanent pressure on the A and B files and has well-known compensation in Benko Gambit type positions. Instead, in this particular situation, it's possible and actually good for white to seize the center with E5. Black must go knight G4 to counterattack the E5 pawn, and it looks like white may have overreached. But after, after, the develop, after knight g5, this is actually the key moment, because if I, had, if I had passively retreated, if I had passively defended my e-pawn with bishop f4, black can play d6 and open up the game before I'm ready. The move knight g5, I had seen this idea in, a, in an analogous position in a book by Yermolinsky called The Road to Chess Improvement. It turns out when black ventures these early lines where white gets a foothold in the center with the e5 move, it turns out that this knight on g4 is short of squares after it takes on e5, surprisingly. White is attacking the knight, and so black has nothing better than to take the e-pawn. But after f4, we notice the black knight is in some trouble and the white knight is aggressively placed out here. White's not winning a piece because black can counterattack white's knight on g5 with the move f6 as he played. That move is forced, and he prepares a retreat for the knight if need be with knight f7. But the time has come to uh, assess the position very concretely, and it turns out white can inconvenience black's king here with the typical blow knight takes h7. This kind of move is called the desperado, you throw it in when there are multiple pieces hit. You just take one of the pieces that is hit and you move it somewhere else where it may be attacked. But when black eliminates it, white has time to take some other piece, and that's what happens here. Black takes the knight off, and white takes black's knight off, and we reach a curious position where black has castled, 
and there are multiple pawns hanging. Nevertheless, uh, white stands better here, mainly because if this pawn on f6 ever left, white's knight would have a beautiful home on g5. So if he can't uh, take the e5 pawn, he's left with taking the b5 pawn. And in this particular position, uh, white stands better. <clears throat> in the game, I played queen to g4, which is a, a, a maneuver to get the queen to an aggressive square, probably h4. <coughs> Excuse me. But actually, backing up a little bit, in this particular position, I had a more accurate move. The more accurate move would be to take the b5 pawn because if black were to take the e5 pawn, I can make a very powerful retreat to d3, and that has the incredibly strong threat of queen to h5, which in fact is unstoppable. Since it's unstoppable, white has a near decisive advantage. I had missed that little detail in my original uh, look at the position. So I played queen to g4, which is not a bad move, but it's not the best. He plays b4. That actually helps me put my knight near his king. In American Swiss tournaments at rapid time controls, it's very useful to be able to uh, bring the pieces near the king because a concentration of pieces near the king leads to a favorable outcome. Black is trying to get the initiative in Benko Gambit type positions, but here white has more pieces near his king. Black tries to get a piece out. White uh, trades the piece gladly because he develops with gain of time after knight a6 castles, and now I've reached my full attacking potential. My remaining pieces, bishop c1, the knight here, of course, my rook, the queen, are all participating usefully against the black king. Black plays the knight back to attack the d5 pawn, and white wastes no time with the rook lift to f3, and already we see that black's position is critical because the g6 pawn is falling after the rook check. He guards the g6 pawn, but now the time is right to pry him open with the typical pawn break d6. It's very pleasing geometrically to have a, a series of pawns like d6 and e5 opposing pawns on e7 and f6 because no matter what happens, all the dark squares will open up favorably for white's attack. In the position, he tries to hang on to the dark squares by, by playing knight d5, but after queen check, king back, rook h3, the king is getting in trouble, and worse news is that after the de capture, which is inevitable, the white knight is going to reach a beautiful home on d6. So this position is a decisive advantage for white, which occurred in, in record time. This player I'm playing is rated like 2450, and it's not often the case that you're going to get such a winning position against a 2450 in only 20 moves. The reason it happened is because I recalled that strong idea from the Yermolinsky book by analogy and applied it here, which was the move knight g5 on move 9. The rest of the game featured black trying to wiggle out to no avail. He played king f7, the evacuation, but after de, my knight is gaining d6. He takes with the queen. As advertised, my knight leaps in, preventing, just to show you, I prevent his king from escaping. In king hunts, it's very important to uh, stop king exit routes. King up, and it's time for uh, white to plan the finish. Starts with queen check. He plays his pawn up, nothing else to do. I can grab a free pawn, king e5, and in this position I have uh, numerous wins. I, I played bishop to g5. Uh, knight to c4 check would have won also. Queen d6. Rook check, and you, as you see, uh, black's king is, is defenseless in the very middle of the board. He played knight to e3, not much else to do. Of course, he's uh, losing. In this particular position, I can win any way I want. One of the easier ways is the deflection sacrifice bishop to f4 check, because if he takes my bishop, the uh, queen is hanging. 
But in such positions, it doesn't matter anymore. White can win any way he wants. And I had uh, ceased worrying about things too much. Instead, I just took the bishop off. And after the king, I just took the knight and I'm up a piece. He runs with the king to nowhere in particular. And I fork his queen and rook. And after he comes in with the queen, I guess he's hoping that I don't notice that the queens are opposed. But it turns out I can just grab his rook off, and now I'm guarding my own queen, and he's down a rook and a piece now. So at this point, he resigned. Going back, just to stress to you, the critical moment in such a game is in the very opening, because black has put down the gauntlet, and white has to prove competency against the given setup. The given setup here, going back, was black not playing d6. If black had played d6, he could have restored the game to Benko Gambit channels. Admittedly, white would stand better, because in most gam Benko Gambits, white either cannot castle, because the black bishop has somehow captured white on f1, or white has lost time in some other manner. But in this particular position, white can just hang on to the pawn with a4, and he's not going to lose the right to castle. Therefore, he stands uh, better than a typical Benko Gambit. Even so, this is the way black should play, because his experimental move in the game was a6, and we met that very powerfully with e5, knight g4, knight g5, which is a maneuver I learned in the Yermolinsky book. And the judgment simply takes place in realizing that Yermolinsky is correct in a typical position after knight e5, f4, f6, knight h7, the desperado sacrifice. That opens the game up to white's advantage. The f-file stays closed because we brought the knight out of g5, and the resulting position after king takes, pawn takes, is, is grossly favorable to white. It just turns out that white has freedom of space behind his pawn advances. In certain positions, these could, could be considered overextended, but not here, because of the e-pawn left, as I said before, the knight gains that beautiful square. So it turns out that after knight h7, king takes, pawn takes, this position, in a higher sense, uh, is almost winning for white, because I have the easy bishop to d3 follow-up, the queen to g4 follow-up, which I played, or many other moves. And in the game after a, b, my best move, bishop b5, is very convincing, because it can come back to d3 soon, and white is just playing with a, a big advantage. So the theme was... Uh, preparedness, not panicking when black plays a very aggressive situation because there's always some kind of logical retort. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that first game. And now we're going to take a look at another game that I played in, in, along similar lines, except this time I was black. Now we're going to do a second game where I'm playing black. Uh, white is a Canadian player, Dean Hergott. This was played way back in 1984 in the Toronto Open. And in this game, white chose a hyper-aggressive setup. In Swiss tournaments, it's practically uh, the most useful thing is to seek initiative, to wrest the initiative out of white's hands when faced with an extremely aggressive posture, to fight for key squares and seek a counterattack. Practically speaking, that's easier than trying to defend passively. It may not be the most classical thing to do, but practically speaking, uh, you can achieve good results if you keep an uh, eye out for counterplay. Let's see the first couple of moves. Uh, he, he played e4. I played g6. He played d4, bishop g7, knight c3, d6. In these days, the most uh, aggressive these days is bishop to e3. Uh, Having said that, after bishop e3, c6, black does retain uh, some chances for a successful outcome, as long as he's not too soon with the e5 move. In these positions, the e5 move often leads to a weakness on d6, which is a problem. 
but in this kind of position, if, if uh, white were to continue with some kind of aggressive setup after b5, we can't eliminate the black fianchetto shadowed bishop yet, and black retains decent counter chances. Let, let's go back to actually what happened. e4, g6, d4, bishop g7, knight c3, d6. Instead of bishop e3, he played the very aggressive bishop to c4, which is called the Holmov attack. The Holmov attack was very popular uh, in the 70s, 80s. Jinjiashvili, Roman Jinjiashvili is a strong grandmaster who came over from Soviet Union in that time frame into the U.S. And he was a proponent of the perk defense for black. So in, in several games, he demonstrated the validity of a setup where you play knight f6, white plays queen e2, the telegraphed intention is to ram the e-pawn up, but the positional c6 is, the, is, the, is a fine move here, which Jinjiash really proved in numerous games. And this occurred in the Hergot game. Black could enter crazy complications with knight c6, and after e5, we reach a famous uh, sacrifice where white gains three pieces for a rook, but black is in danger of collecting numerous pawns, and this position is unclear. It's not to black's liking to enter a position that is wild and oversharp, because the move c6 that's available to black is a, is a sound defense because the e5 battering ram can always be met by the knight finding a home on d5. That means that black is, is going to retain chances of a successful outcome. White goes ahead with the programmed pawn move. After pawn takes, pawn takes, knight to d5, the knight has found a home, and white plays the book move bishop to d2, threatening castles long, or preparing castles long. The question is, who stands better? Well, the e5 pawn is both a weakness and a strength. It limits black's bishop temporarily, but it could become weak later. Is black's king under immediate attack? No. Black, black can get the king to safety, which he does. White gets his king to safety. And now we reach a, a crossroads. In this particular position, if black were to play the inaccurate bishop to e6, the un the unpleasant thing is that after knight to f3, white is threatening to come out with the knight to g5 in certain positions, and white uh, is going to retain an advantage here after, for example, knight d7, h4. White is a little bit faster in the attack than black, and black faces an unpleasant defense. However, this is all well known, especially to Jinjashvili, because he has deep opening knowledge, and he proved a long time ago that b5, which I played in the Hergot game, is, is a successful defense because it combines attacking elements in it. It offers pawns all over the place, but if white starts taking pawns, that leaves a vacuum around white's king, and black, uh, as in dragon setups, can quickly use open lines to get to white's king. White, in this position, was surprised, and uh, one of the points is that after knight takes, Black can take on c4, and black has gained the two bishops. That's, that's one of the points of, of the variation. So white took this way. Bishop takes, and after pawn takes, of course, numerous pawns are hanging. But it turns out if white were to take uh, a pawn off, for example, the queen takes b5, black can just defend and then, then harass the white queen and gain an attack on white's king. In this position, white first threw in the move bishop to g5, which optically looks nice because it prevents the uh, solidifying e6 move. And it looks like black's pawns are hanging everywhere. And this is a very sharp position. But it turns out that black is going to get the kind of position he wants against white's aggressive setup because what black can simply develop uh, hanging the b5 pawn and as in the case of dragons, when you take pawns like that, you're going to be giving black an open line against white's king. Sure enough, after white takes the b5 pawn, black just gets out of the way with queen c7, and black has automatic compensation in this position. Queen c7 was played. Now white's best chance in this position, although it's not clear, the best chance would be knight takes d5, 
bishop takes, rook takes, rook c8 threatening mate, c3, something like this, e6 hitting the rook, rook d2, knight c6, and black retains excellent compensation because of the open white king and the possibility of uh, attacking white's king. That, un although, having said that, that would be bl white's best chance. Now, if that's white's best chance, with white's king being so open, it's clear black has had a successful opening. So black, black just played queen to c7. Now, white, after some cogitation, uh, wanted to keep the initiative at all costs, and he played rook takes d5, which had uh, ideas of if black were to take white's rook and white were to take back, this uh, white could then meet queen e5 with, with knight e7, and you're winning all sorts of pawns for the exchange. However, after rook takes d5, if you pause a moment, uh, the game can be played under one motto, and the motto is, is black should be attacking at all costs. Don't think about endings. Think about the fact that white's king side is still sleeping here, still sleeping. White's king is not at all happy here because black has open lines on B and C. If you're a dragon player, you're going to want to keep the king, the queens on. And so a6 hitting the white queen, and already we have an, an unpleasant situation for white. In the game, he played queen to c5, desperately trying to get the queens off. You notice what a change this is. He started out attacking, and now he's just trying to get the queens off at all costs. Black simply avoids with queen b7. And now we just have a very unpleasant position for white. It doesn't matter how many pawns black is losing. Because after white takes, which happened in the game, rook e8, all black is doing is keeping tension, <clears throat> preparing to develop the remaining pieces, and then he'll be able to focus a coordinated attack on white's king. White brought the bishop to safety, and at this point black just develops with gain of time, and it's clear white's opening has been a complete failure. White brings the queen somewhere guarding the rook, and at this point, the easiest way uh, for black in this position, which I didn't appreciate, the easiest way would be to break out with knight e5 because the rook is actually pinned against the g2 pawn. And so knight e5 has catastrophic threats like knight c4, and white's position would collapse. But having missed that move, I played knight b6. Again, the rook is semi-pinned to the g2 pawn, but it's not uh, quite as serious. Rook d1. And now in this position, I played the correct move, knight c4, which hits the queen and threatens mate. He must play queen to b4 to guard the mate. And at this point, I chose to take on g2, hitting the rook, but that lets white fight on. If you were to look at it a little bit more, by far the easiest would be to tra trade the queens at this point and then give this check, which is familiar to dragon lovers, forcing the white king away, and then the super accurate rook e to b8. And it turns out that white, the move a3 doesn't help after a5, the b2 pawn is falling and with it the game. That would be the most logical conclusion would be if I had found um, knight c4. In the game, I played knight to here first, queen b4, and in this position I missed, as I said, the exchange of queens, queen b4 and bishop check and rook e b8. Instead I played the inferior queen g2 which lets him struggle on after knight g e2. I hit the queen with a5, and after queen b5, white is still in the game. I take the, the f2 pawn, of course black is better, and after king b1, I can just keep taking things with knight e5. 
white attacks my queen. I retreat there because knight c4 is happening soon anyway. He puts his knight to a seemingly threatening location. And after knight d7, I'm threatening various nasty things with the rook to b8, sacrificing to gain b2. c3. And it's true white has done the best he could to minimize the damage. Black removes the knight. Queen takes. Knight f6. Queen f3. Rook e3. Queen f2. And now black can wind up with a combination. The combination, which actually occurred in a similar uh, position once in a, in a Korshnoi Fisher game, is after knight e4, queen g2, queen b7, black's lining up on the queen, threatening knight c3. Black, white stops the check on c3 with queen, king c2, but as in the Korchnoi Fischer game a long time ago, Fischer swindled Korchnoi with knight takes bishop in broad daylight, suddenly black won a piece because rook d6 is impossible, because the queens are hanging, and if queen takes b7 alternately, knight b7, and white is just down a piece, so he uh, gave up. Let me go back to the beginning of this game. I just want to stress to you, the critical moment was early on. It was a perk defense, or modern defense. Moderns become perks when the uh, knight comes out to f6. So this is actually perk defense. This is the whole mob attack. C6 is a sound defensive line. E5 takes, takes, knight d5. Bishop d2. Castles. Castles. And here, black uh, dictates the events for the rest of the game by playing the uh, early b5, which I had seen from Junjiashvili. And this is a very strong idea, psychologically, because white's trying to checkmate black. But it turns out now, white's going to have to start accepting pawn sacrifices, which open up lines to his own king. So psychologically, if white comes out very aggressive and you know some kind of setup that has validity, such as the Chinjashvili uh, move b5, it's very worthwhile because the resulting structure is going to be black attacking white, and that's the last thing white wants to do. In the first game, the Mahaliuk game, black tried to come out swinging, and then white came out with a positional retort, which led to black's king being open. Here, white goes for castling opposite sides and goes for a quick central break, but black has this crazy-looking wing break, which hangs pawns, but gives him a huge attack. In, in both cases, uh, the ideas prove successful. So I hope you enjoy these two games. These were pretty sharp games. They're sharper than normal, but they illustrate the best way to deal with very aggressive opponents. Next time, we're going to be looking at more refined ideas, especially ideas that lead to uh, favorable endings and, and shut down the opponent's counterplay. But these two games were, were typical, I think, for Swisses when both players really need a win. So with that, I will uh, end the first episode and uh, see you next time. Thank you.